3607. We're joyfully anticipating, you ready for this? New Salem Baptist Church and New Salem United Methodist Church's Easter sunrise service. We're going to do that. And uh, uh, so uh, it's our time to preach and it's their time to serve breakfast. So uh, Jim said he would give us a an exact time as we go along, I know that y'all are looking forward to getting back together. Were y'all able to do that last year? No? So we'll, we'll do that this year, uh, good Lord willing. Uh, if you have a prayer request or a joy that needs announcing, please write it down on a prayer card from the pew and put it in an offering plate during the collection time to be read during prayer time. That really helps us in keeping a current prayer list. And... Um, uh, and it just really helps us with our prayer discipline. We want to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks on being prayed for. Um, Ruth, you had a card? A card came to church from a lady called Jamie Baker, and she said, thanks for your kindness and thoughtfulness. Hope you know how very much you're appreciated and what a difference you make. And then she wrote, thank you for all that you have done to help me through the holidays. So, many of you know Jamie Baker, and um, thank you to the church. Any other announcements that we need to make? We're going to sit some back, and we're, we're, we're back to doing something different. Uh, let's start with a psalm this morning as we open worship. Let's open with this psalm found on page 794. And then remain standing to sing the opening hymn, Love Divine, All Love is Excelling, and then the Apostles' Creed. If you would read in the bold type. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. I have been an example to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not keep me from the evil that I have done. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together, saying, God has forsaken me. O oh God, be not far from me. Oh my God, may to help me. I am glad that you as a church have been an example for many, like that psalm says. If you would turn to page uh, 384.
Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you would say to them, the peace of God be with you. And if you would say, and with you also. The peace of God be with you. And with you also. Amen. If you prepare an offering for the Lord. Almighty God, as we pray today, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of the beauty of the snow. We thank you, God, for the brilliance of the sun that drives the weather. Lord, we thank you for every kindness and every mercy that you have shed upon our lives. Lord, we thank you for providing for us, for providing for us, for protecting us. We thank you, God, that you have called us to be your people in this world. Lord, as we pray and as we thank you for all the goodness that you shed abroad in our lives, we return unto you a portion of that which you've given that your kingdom might go forward in this earth. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Page 170 in your hymnal. I love this. I like this. I, I, this is a, this is one of my favorites. <laughs>
Because he first loved me. Because he first loved you. Amen. Have a praying for Scarlett Velez. Uh, she's still in a cast, but she can now put pressure on her foot. So we've got, uh, she's doing better. So that, that little, that little overcomer's had a rough little journey. So, you know, pray for her that, that she, uh, continues to make progress this way. We have an unspoken request today that we've written in. Uh, Eddie Merritt's in UAB with COVID, so we want to pray for Eddie. Um, and we got several people around here that, that has COVID. Um, and I know uh, people got different ways of looking at this, but you know, it seems like this iteration of COVID is not as dangerous. You know, it seems like, you know, and I'm sure that it is for some people, but I tell you, uh, if you're hunting something, be thankful about. Let's be thankful that this, that does affect children, was not like the first go around. Because I don't think we as a, as a country could, we, we could not have born watching our children die. So, uh, things to thank God for. Thank God that this is less than what it has been. And thank God in, in advance that, you know, one of these days this is going to be a memory and it's going to be all gone. Thankful for that. Anybody else that we need to pray for, that we need to lift up in prayer? I encourage you to... Uh, to keep your bulletin during the week and let the names on the back of this bulletin be part of your prayer discipline. Pray for these people. Pray for these, these things and the concerns that we have. So as we go before the Lord in prayer, let's remember Scarlett. Let's remember Eddie. Let's remember this unspoken request. God, you told us to bring our cares and our worries and our fears before you and to give them into your hands and into your keeping. Lord, as we pray to you this day, we pray that you would be with Scarlett, with Eddie. Lord, we pray that your presence would be with those people on that prayer list in our bulletin. Lord, we pray that you would be with each of us this week, that you would guide us to truly be your people, to be a voice and to be a witness in this world. Lord, as we thank you today, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name and worship. Lord, thank you for that opportunity Thank you, God, for making it just that easy, is that we gather and we worship you, our loving God, our creator, our redeemer. Lord, as we pray today, we pray for our nation. We pray that you would guide it. We pray for that your spirit would be over the people of this nation, that your ways would be our ways. Lord, as we pray, we pray for this world. And we ask again for your Holy Spirit to be involved in this world. That you would set up and take down, that you would arm and disarm, that you would have your way and your will, and that people would be redeemed in your name. Lord, as we pray, we pray for your church. We pray for not just this church, but we pray for your church, the body of Christ in this place and in all places, that we might truly speak and sing and lift up the beauty and glory of you, our God, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray all these things and we ask these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the acolytes. If you are an acolyte and if you've been going to training, would you come up, please? It's a big day for acolytes. Now, we've got some that, that, that are sick and, and uh, some that are not, but... Uh, but we're, we've got like 10 or 11, so most of us are here today. And so this is their installation for the year 2022. And so these will be our people who begin worship on Sunday morning. And they are uh, they're a good bunch of people, and I've enjoyed working with them. And we have monthly meetings. We won't have a meeting today. To practice because I need to stay sort of separate from them and Ruth is going to come up and give them their pen uh, but you might want to sit there with me Ruth because I may preach just a little bit okay. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Brenda for the uh, the, the Cottas, I, they've got a name that's what they are uh, uh, and so uh, we're going to have some more sort of fits them and they have the seasonal colors on the stoves so that with the collar so they can change them and I noticed that that uh, some of the guys were you know they were a little reticent about these you know collar things but I, I told them I said we'll put numbers on them for you <laughs> you know like what was your number Riley 71 78 yeah, so you see an act like with a number on it. That's why that was the price of getting them to wear a collar, right? Uh, yeah, and so uh, we'll only wear those during high seasons of the church for a while. So, uh, but Brenda, thank you so much for doing that. They're beautiful. And, and, uh, but I wanted to talk to you about how important this is. I know uh, the... Uh, the scripture that we had today was out of Isaiah, and, uh, and the Lord told Isaiah to go and speak for him. And Isaiah's response was, I'm just a child. And God said, don't say you're just a child. Uh, a lot of people will overlook the importance of young people. But they are not just children. This is their, as their servanthood for the Lord begins. While Lee and I was talking about, you actually grew it, about a friend that she grew up with. And she said, you know, we started off together. And, and, and she said, I know she's a Christian, but she said, she's just not really made any progress. She's just sort of a nominal kind of person, just a nominal kind of Christian. And I told Swaline, I said, the difference between you and her is that you became a servant of the Lord. See, there are things about the kingdom of God and our relationship with Jesus Christ that we can only learn through servanthood because this is a kingdom of servants. Not the kingdom of people being served, but a kingdom of servants. So today, uh, we want to welcome these servants. This is very often a person's first opportunity to serve the Lord in the church. So this is a big day for them. This is the beginning of their servanthood for the rest of their life. And I know that you're going to support them and you're going to value them and you're going to, to love them as they do this. Acolytes are servants and they're the pastor's assistants. They bear the light symbolizing the presence of God into the congregation at the beginning of each 
service. And they light the candles on the altar. These candles represent God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And we have a cross that completes the Trinitarian state. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. At the end of the service, they take fire from the altar and take it out of the sanctuary symbolically into the world as God's people leave the sanctuary bearing forth the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit within them. Remember that when you leave following these acolytes as they go out, you have the presence of God in you, and you are leaving and going into the world to bear forth that presence to the world. Being an acolyte is very often the unbeliever's first act of servanthood within the body of Christ. So Ruth, now if you're ready, if you would join with me as we bless these 2022 acolytes for service to the Lord. What Ruth will do after we pray for them, and you stretch your hands forth to bless them. Uh, we got to remember that Marshall is sick today, so he can't be here. Who else is sick and not here, y'all? So we got we got some that aren't here today because of that, but we will do this next week as they come in. So, um, so these are our acolytes, and um, I want you to pray with me, stretch your hands forth as we bless them for service. If y'all would gather over here, children. And Ruth has the pins that we will give them. They got brand new pins. They are up to date, high performance pins that we got for them. Almighty God, we thank you for these who have chosen to serve you. Lord, as we stretch our hands forth toward them, we pray your blessing upon them as they serve you this year. Lord, knowing that this is the beginning of a lifetime of being servants to you, our great God. Bless them in the work that they do. Bless them in the joys that they have. And Lord, bless them as they lead us in worship each Sunday. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Ruth, if you would There we go. Ready? You'll come and get more. I love it. I've had the people, believe it or not, through the years for some reason or another, I've had a lot of people invite me to their churches and to talk about church growth and how you cause churches to grow, how you enable churches to grow. And, you know, people got all kinds of ideals. ideas. Some of them like, oh, we need to put together this worship that pretty much tantamount to revolving mirror balls and flying monkeys and, you know, big band kind of stuff. And I said, no, I, that's not what it, you know. I said, here's my secret to church growth. Start with the children. Start with the children. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for this. These are indicative of the kingdom of heaven. So the thing about it is, is it pleases God when we gather the little children, when we base our growth, when we start our growth right there, right where Jesus said to do it. And here's another thing that's more practical. 
very few of these children have a driver's license. That means every time they show up at church, it takes about three adults to give them. So it builds your church. Uh, thank you so much for your support of them, and thank you for allowing Wileen and I to teach them and be part of their lives. So, children's sermon, who's got that? Good morning. Uh, how many of y'all have ever been to another church that's a little bit bigger than our church? Have you ever been to a church that's a little bit bigger? How many, how many of you have been to a church that's a lot bigger than our church? And so by a lot, that just means that there's just tons and tons of people, right? So this, uh, this past weekend, we went to Resurrection, and it was like being at a church that's a lot bigger than our church. And one, and one thing that I thought was kind of interesting about it is that you just don't think that there are that many people that are worshiping God together um, at one time, you know? And so when you get with a big old group of people, all of a sudden it's like, wow, it's amazing to be in a crowd of people that are worshiping God all at the same time. And when I got to thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, I, I have a friend who has told me this before, our, the way that we think when we worship God is we're not just worshiping God. Uh, as Reese has said, it's just not just locally and with the, the, the body of Christ, which is actually the body of Christ. We were a little bit more a part of it at the resurrection in terms of there were more people there, right? So physically with us. But we are worshiping with the body of Christ in terms of everybody on this planet uh, on, uh, and everybody that has gone before us that's, that's in heaven. Uh, there's a great cloud of witnesses, they say, in the Bible that has taught us and revealed to us the truths of Scripture. Another thing that, that kind of came to me that I think uh, is cool is like the, the, the spirit that we should all have of being the servant, right? Of being servants of God. We're not here to serve, uh, to be served, but we're here to serve. And that reminded me, so, so as we're worshiping, we're number one, we're, we're knowing that it's not just this little group here. It's, it's, there's a bigger group that, uh, that we're worshiping with, and even though we can't see them. Great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us. But there's this verse that's really, really awesome that reminds me of, ser uh, of that servant mentality, that how we should be servants. That means we should seek to do things for other people, not look for them to do stuff for us. And it says, in your relation, and this is in Philippians, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So he wasn't even looking, Jesus, who's worthy of everything, you know, he, he's perfect. Um, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And this is one of my favorite things right here that I think of whenever I was thinking about resurrection and everything. I think about everybody, the whole world, the whole universe, all of creation, everything bowing down before Jesus and worshiping him. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's why we're all here, y'all, is uh, when we are here, we are here to worship God, to glorify God. We can do it when we're in just really small groups, or we can do it when we're in bigger groups like at Resurrection, but, but that's why we're all here. We confess that. That means that we really, really believe it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for our home church, New Salem United Methodist Church. We thank you for these, this community of people that pray for us and that we worship God together. We thank you that we are all seek to be servants, Lord. If we start having temptations to be served, help us to 
be more like servants, just like you were, who died on the cross for our sins and served us and served the world. Because without you, we have no hope. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> This morning is 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Luke 4, 21 through 30. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do hear also in your hometown the things that we heard you did at Capernaum. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The word of God for the people of God. As we celebrate this epiphany, I tell you know that's sort of a new word to a lot of people, or most of us know in a literary sense what it means, but. I, I sort of use this instead of the word epiphany. It's like, aha, 
that aha moment that you know you've seen little cartoons where years ago where when the person got it a little light bulb came on up above their head uh, uh, these stories these these scriptures that come to us during epiphany are revealing the purpose of God in all the scripture this whole Bible Everything in this Bible is a story about how God is revealing himself to the world through a chosen people. How God is revealing himself to the world through a chosen people. Um, this is about Jesus being revealed to the world. These stories are, they're, they're, they're the same thing that the God, Jesus as God, is being revealed story by story to the people in those days. Um, as you think about those epiphany moments and those aha moments, um, uh, you realize that the point that the Bible is making is that no world, you cannot, you are not allowed to, come up with your own definitions of God. No, one God idea is not as good as another one. You know, that sounds a little bit intolerant, but the scripture is about Jesus being revealed as God. So, in a world that thinks that we can just put together any idea of God that we want to and it will work, this is God that we're talking about. That's the aha. Jesus is being revealed. And the first stories, I wanted to go through these, are the first on Epiphany Sunday, the story was about from out of Matthew, and it was about the wise men, and they came to Herod. And they said, we're, we're, we're looking for that one that's to be born. And Herod himself called together the 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 uh, the the, the the scribes and the priests and, and the chief priests, and, and he asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? That word Messiah, the Lord's Christos, the anointed, that is a God word. Herod wanted to know where God was going to be born. And you know the story, don't you? Herod said, you guys go find him. And then come back and tell me so I can go worship him too. But his intent was to find out where he was and kill him. You would think that as God is revealed to the world, mankind would embrace him. But mankind's first attempt was to kill him. And in this story that comes after Jesus comes to his hometown and he reads a selection of scripture that he chose, a messianic portion of the Bible out of the 61st chapter of Isaiah, you would think that the people of Nazareth would just absolutely go wild. Well, they did. They pushed him to the edge of a cliff and was going to push him over. But the scripture said he passed through their midst. One of the strangest things that happened to me was uh, when I was saved in 1973, you know, I thought everybody that I knew would be happy that I was saved. Everybody in my family got mad. Really. Because at that point, nobody in my family had a relationship with Christ. My grandmothers were dead. The people who raised me in the knowledge of the Lord were gone. Nobody else was saved. And boy, it was a rough go for a long time. God is not always greeted with that aha. Uh -huh. <coughs> God is greeted a lot of times with hostility. And there's nothing in the world that this world would like more than to get rid of the authentic God. 
to get rid of this God that troubles us and calls us to live in ways beyond ourselves, calls us to be uncomfortable servants rather than the privileged and the servant. But these stories, the next week, this epiphany story was when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. You want to talk about it? You want to talk about an aha moment? A voice from heaven, God's voice upon Jesus' baptism said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Two big God words, Messiah, my son. Who said that Jesus was God's son? God said Jesus was God's son. The next week, Jesus turns water into wine and the scripture, it just seems like, you know, it's sort of a throwaway. It's just a wedding and they run out of wine and Jesus' mama tells him to do something about it. And he said, not yet, mom, it's not my time yet. But when your mama tells you to do something, what? You do it. That is a rule of life, children. I mean, that even works when your mama is old, okay? I mean, it, uh, uh, but he did, in the scripture said, this was the first of his signs. This was, the, this was the first sign that pointed the public to him that there is something different about this guy. There's something different. As we go into the next week, which was, I think, last week, Jesus was becoming a phenomenon as he came into his home territory in Galilee uh, people were everywhere around him. He went to Nazareth to his home and he went to the synagogue and he read from Isaiah the 61st chapter. And this is important that we get this. It said, Jesus, then filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. Oh, by the way, Jesus went to church. Did you see that? For people that think you don't need to go, if Jesus needed to go, you need to go. Okay? He went to synagogue as was his custom. Okay? And he stood up to read. And that's something that was something that young Jewish males did. They went in and on a rotational basis or if they were a guest who was coming back, they were given the, given the privilege of reading from the scroll. And they got to choose what they were going to read. And what Jesus chose, it said that the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and he unrolled the scroll and found this place. In other words, he chose this. He chose to read this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. He has sent me to proclaim recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and I'll tell you why they were fixed. This is a messianic portion of Scripture. The Jews knew this from all the way from Isaiah. When this happened, that was the Messiah. And as he stood in the middle of that synagogue, his hometown, and he read that, said he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, 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 this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing and in your presence. That was Jesus saying, I am God. No world, 
Here's a big aha for you, a big epiphany. We can't just cobble together our own God ideas and they work. We have to worship and serve the true God, the God who is the very God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's what these epiphany lessons are about as we go through them. They're making the statement, the church's ancient statement, that Jesus is God. Jesus is God's Son. There is no other God. There are no other gods. This is God. I am glad that this is the God that called me. This is the God that called you. This is the God that called those little people who were standing here a while ago beginning their servanthood with the Lord. But we also understand something about that is that that was Jesus' mission statement. He's God. And they understood it when he said today this has happened in your presence. They understood he was saying I'm God. I mean, but this is also his mission statement. He's telling what God is up to. This is what God is up to. This is God's intent. What God has chosen to do is in that mission statement. So, uh, what God's chosen to do about the world. To bring good news to the poor. To proclaim release to captive. To proclaim recovery of spiritual sight to people, to free the oppressed, to let the world know of God's favor. The only thing about this is there's power, money, and control and bad news and in keeping people in the dark and keeping people captive, and keeping people ignorant and oppressing people. But what God is up to is about setting people free. If you want to know what God did in Jesus Christ, he set us all free. Free from the fear of death. Free from the things that hold us captive. Free from the blindness that causes us to be spiritually unaware of what's going in the world. What God is up to through Jesus Christ is making people free. That's why they want rid of him. That's every complaint about Jesus. That's why the world wants to erase him from the board. That's why Herod wanted to find out where he was at. That's why Joseph and Mary had to go to Egypt to protect Jesus when he was a baby. From the time that he came into this world, the world's been trying to get rid of him because the world is into making slaves and controlling people. And God is into setting people free. I get thinking about, though, personal mission statements. I know um, businesses have rediscovered mission statements. I've seen a couple of businesses and talked to a couple of people, and, and, uh, and, and, and it's a strange thing that you will have a business and all this glossy kind of publicity kind of stuff will say, our mission statement is. You know what's really odd? You don't see a whole lot of churches that say, our mission statement is. Jesus said what he was about. Those businesses say what they're about. Very few churches even say what they're about. What's our mission? Here's one a little better for us to think about. What's your mission statement? You're here on a mission. You're not here by accident. I'm not here by accident. What's your mission statement? What is the purpose that drives your life? You might want to think about that, and I might want to think about that. But God helps us with that. 
I want to read just a little bit more of what Jesus was talking about in that 61st chapter of Isaiah. So the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to proclaim the day of the vengeance of God. Whoa. To comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins, and they shall raise up the former de devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities and the devastations of many generations. Wow. Jesus' mission statement said he was going to set people free so they could be restorers, so they could be repairers, so they could be the people who reestablish. That's what you and I are. That's why Jesus set us free, to help people restore their lives. I was going to help you with that mission statement. Here's one for all of us. And we can start our mission statement here. Jesus gathered his disciples. You, you and I can recite that. Here's a mission statement. It's one that you and I need to own, even as we put our own mission statement in conjunction with this one. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go there for and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to live by the values of this kingdom, and obey everything that I have commanded you. That's why I put that, the values of the kingdom thing in there. That's our mission. As baptized Christians, as people that God saved, that's our mission, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. I don't know what this church's mission statement is. Do y'all have a mission statement? Does anybody know? Does it have anything to do with that? You know, and I'm not going to tell you to go and put another one together, but I just want to say that's what you and I are supposed to be doing. Going in the authority of Jesus Christ and making disciples of these little people, of the people that we know in the world, baptizing these people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching people to live by the values of the kingdom of God, obeying all the I'm going to owe y'all four minutes and 35 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather said something to me when I was sort of a young buck. something else that was pretty amazing too. He said, you need to be at work. He said, because most of the trouble that you will get into, you will get into because you're not doing anything for that. It's in our leisure and our laying around that we get in trouble. It's in our servanthood 
and our productiveness. It's in our lives that are lived with intent and purpose that we grow in the image of God. So I have a purpose. Define what your purpose is. Think about it this week. Your mission statement in conjunction with that mission statement that is Jesus' command for all of us who believe. Now I can't get an acolytes if y'all are ready when y'all come. Riley and Jude, there we go. Uh, Here we go. Um, while and I were talking this week, because we were all locked up with each other and we couldn't get away. <laughs> but we were, and being quarantined gave us time to realize and to really explore just how blessed we are. Just how blessed we are and how good God has been to us. And last week, having missed church, um, one of the things that I already knew but I realized even more was that uh, you are part of that blessing that God has blessed us with. And I just wanted to tell you, it is such a privilege to have been called to be your pastor. And I really missed you guys last week. And I'm just glad I didn't have to bail any of you out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> so today, if you would receive all this, receive it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Page what, Judy? Page 557. <laughs> Keep you and you go forth and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and commanding them to obey all the things that Jesus has commanded. Go in peace and go in grace. Amen. Amen.